privilege for me to be able to be here this morning. This is actually only my second church I've ever attended in my life, and uh, was at the first church. Uh, I, I don't even know if you said that for was born in that church. I was on staff for 35 years at that church. And then uh, about three years ago, I had a young man who um, took me out to lunch and he said, hey, I want to change the world. Do you want to come with me? And I'm like, sure. Sounds great. And he was a young man who was in a discipleship program. He became a successful businessman. And he goes, you know, I want to leverage my business for kingdom purposes. And I need someone to help me. And so being on staff at a church 35 years, doing church my entire life, it was like, wow, that sounds kind of fun, something new to do. So uh, three years ago, I left the church that I had been at for so many years and ministered at and loved and started something new called Enbridge Global, and now we are encouraging businesses to uh, give back to the kingdom of God and see God do great things, not only here locally, but here globally as well. So that's what I am get to do now. And as Pastor Sam said, it's such a privilege to be able just to, to hang out with Sam and Dea. They love this church. I hope you guys know that. I get to pray with Sam, and uh, he has a heart for this church. He loves you guys, and uh, it's a privilege privilege to be able to to be able to be up here and share a little bit about what God's put on my heart. Um, I haven't shared in like three years. I haven't preached uh, a sermon, so I'm a little rusty, and I have to wear glasses now, which is a little bit hard for me, but uh, I hope uh, I can see my notes. Um, we've been here for three years, and I want to do a little church calisthenics here. If you've been here for 10 years or less, would you stand up? 10 years or less. For all of you guys who are sitting down, thank you for your faithfulness here to Arling Assembly. You guys are the pillars of this church. Um, all righty. Well, this, a large portion of us is 10 years or less. Five years or less, uh, you can... Uh, no, five years or more, you got to stay standing. So five, five to ten years, you can sit down. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you've been here for five years or less, keep standing. <laughs> Sorry. Wait a second. Am I up or am I down? <laughs> okay. How about three years or less, keep standing. Two years or less. One year. Can we give these guys a hand? These guys are still standing. I love that. You guys can all be seated. So I'm, a, I'm part of the three-year crowd. And I want to I just want to share a little bit about my family. So this is kind of a, an interesting sermon. I told Pastor Sam just before I got up here, I said, you know, I don't think I've ever done a survey sermon. I typically take a passage of Scripture like Pastor Sam does, and I love that, and we dissect it and we go through it. Well, today the Lord actually put, Sam said, hey, why don't you talk about the church? And I said, okay. And as I started getting into it, I realized, you know what? I, I feel like the Lord said, let's do a survey. Let's kind of do the whole picture, how it all started, and then and land kind of where we're going. So it's going to be, hopefully you can run with me. But before I do that, I want to sh just give you a little history of who I am. So I want to show you my family. Uh, I have five girls and a beautiful wife. Um, so privileged. Uh, been so blessed, and our family has grown from five daughters to now we got this big crowd of uh, kids and son-in-laws. I got four son-in-laws, one son-in-law uh, coming here in May, and I have uh, another granddaughter we just found out this week, granddaughter coming in July. I'm excited about that. The reason I wanted to show you that picture is because I have been blessed by the local church. Two of my girls are uh, pastors. One is a worship pastor. One's a children's pastor. Two of my son-in-laws are pastors. I, I didn't, uh, well, I'll get into that later. Two of my, past, my son-in-laws are pastors. Uh, they all love Jesus, and they all are following after the Lord. And, you know, it's, it is not because they're mom and dad, 
but it's really the grace of God that has been on the church. And we as a family have been blessed by this thing we call the body of Christ. Our family has been enriched, and they are solid in who they are um, because of the grace of God on the people of God. And so I wanted to share a little bit about that because that's where I want to go today. I want to talk about the people of God and the family called this church. But let's start off by praying. Father, I pray that you would use the simple words that I have and the thoughts. And Lord, I pray that you, Spirit of God, would weave them into the lives here at Arlington Assembly. That together, oh God, we might glorify you. By together, we might know you. And by together, Lord, we would make you known to this world by the grace that is on this place. Be lifted up, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I want to give you a little bit of background. Like I said, my church, ha my family has been amazingly blessed by the local church. And not just the church, but a revived church, a church that loves Jesus and has been changed. And I want to kind of go back on where I'm going to go today. I'm going to talk to you about that the church is the conduit for God's blessing in our lives. It's the major conduit of God blessing us and our family is going to come through the church. Then I want to talk to you very quickly about the birth of the church and how this whole thing started because Jesus did something very specific when he started the church. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about being the church and what it means to be the church as we as Arlington Assembly are a witness here. So that's kind of where I'm going. Um, but if you would indulge me just for a moment, I want to share with you a little bit about my family history. Um, Psalms 145 verse 4 says this, one generation commends your works to the other and they tell of your mighty acts. You know, that is church. The church is a vibrant, revived uh, group of people that is meant to be a blessing on this earth. My family's history uh, starts all the way back in Northern Europe, and I'll give you a picture of where my family is from. They're from a place called Ernschelsvik, Sweden, if we can go there, all the way up way north, basically a hundred some miles from the Arctic Circle. So my family's, my personal family's back, we have a family tree all the way to 1600. But what happened was in this small little town called Ernschelsvik, which if I transliterate it, it means Eagle Shield Bay, um, a, a town that is very much like Arlington. About 12,000 was a logging town. They had a paper mill there. My mom and dad, my mom was a city girl, grew up kind of in the city of which, you know, wasn't that big. My dad grew up for generations on the farm, which was about six miles outside of the town. And they were, uh, you know, they were people that my mom went to church, my dad not so much. Uh, if you know Sweden, it's generally a Lutheran country, but especially in, uh, if you live in the country, it's hard to be at church every Sunday. And something happened in about 1939, 1940. My mom was just uh, a young teen and my dad was just about 20. The Spirit of God began to move across Scandinavia. And it's interesting because we actually sat down with a young Finnish girl who went to Bible school just uh, two days ago. And she goes, I heard about the revival that happened in Scandinavia in the 1940s. And I go, my mom and dad were a part of that. My mom uh, grew up in this church, and the Spirit of God fell. And it didn't just happen once. Well, what was happening in a broader scale was that that was right before World War II. And there was a lot of fear in Europe that Nazi Germany was going to invade, and they actually did in 1940 into Norway. So there was a lot of fear. But at the same time, there was a move of God that happened. And in this small little town, all of a sudden, the churches started to fill up. And they not only filled up, they filled overflowing. I got to go back to that church some years ago and preach a message there. It's a church a little bit larger than this, about 350 or 400. And the church, my mom said, something happened. It was like the Spirit of God moved and people just started flowing in. 
She goes, it was packed out, not just one time a week, but five days a week, the place was full to overflowing, so much so that they had to pay, my mom said, you could pay one Swedish crown to be seated on the, on the ground floor, on the, on, the, on the first floor, because the balcony was so hot that people wanted to sit down there, but if they put a, a, a Swedish crown, then you could get a, you could get a reserved seat down, down below. I want to show you a picture um, of what happened. My mom was a part of what they call, Dea, you'll love this. This was what my mom called a string band. This is, was their worship team, a group of 55. And you can see my, actually my dad's on the front row. My mom was a piano player. They had a whole row of guitar players. They had some trumpet players. My dad played mandolin. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't that be cool? Come to church and have like 12 mandolins and, tw- and 15 guitars all playing for worship. That's what happened. Matter of fact, I'll, you can flip off of that. My dad wasn't a part of the church. My dad was out in the country, and the young people got so on fire for God that they would go out and they would do what's called outpost meetings, and they would go to a barn and they would just preach the gospel. Whoever would come, and my dad being far out, he and his two brothers uh, went to one of these outpost meetings. And they sat there, and there was a young 20-some-year-old evangelist gal who was preaching the gospel. And they were sitting there, and the conviction of God came on them. And they were, my, my uncle, who is a year older than my dad, uh, poked my dad and said, do you want to go forward? And my dad said, yes. And they went forward, and they gave their heart to, their, to the Lord that night. And their older brother, which was unfortunate, <laughs> He just got mad, and he walked out the back door. And, you know, my family history is interesting because the differences between my dad and my one uncle and their families and the blessing of God that has been on their family and just uh, our old, my oldest uncle and just the brokenness that he lived in the rest of his life, such a dramatic difference. And why? Because of a revived people and the people of God called the church that blessed my family. 1953, my parents got married, and, and uh, before I was born, and they immigrated to the United States again because of a w- threat of a war. Uh, they were worried that the Soviet Union was going was gonna to come through. And so my mom and dad decided, well, let's uh, get out of Dodge a little bit, and let's go to, uh, to America. They had some friends, some people in their, in their town who had come to Seattle, and they came to Seattle, and they landed here in Ballard, where all Scandinavians do in Seattle. And uh, they went to the, the only Scandinavian church that, you know, they could talk to people. It was a church called Philadelphia Church in Ballard. And, you know, that church was experiencing revival. They walked in, and the church was full. And matter of fact, my father-in-law, who uh, came from Minnesota, was there. And he said, you know, it was so cool. He goes, while we were in church, the Spirit of God, they were putting chairs everywhere. He goes, we'd have a Saturday night prayer meeting. And he goes, we would get there at about 7, 7.30. And he says, there were nights where we wouldn't leave church until 2 a.m. And then we'd get up in the morning and we'd get to church at 9 a.m. for church service once again. The Spirit of God changed my family. Then my parents, actually, they left uh, Philadelphia Church for a church plant in Edmonds. And uh, matter of fact, that church planted a number of churches, including Cisco Heights up here in, in Arlington. And uh, they went to a church, and it was a good church. It was a church about 120, 130 people for about, about oh boy, 18, 19 years. And then <clears throat> about 1979, 1980, we experienced revival again some water here. And I was just in high school, and our church blew up. We went from 130 people to well over 2,000 in four years. And it was like crazy. It was so fun to go to church. I was like, whoa, you know, and I would, we were at church all the time. And then, you know, church is messy. We went through some hard days. And then we kind of hit the wall, and there were some years. But then in 1992, I actually, during that time, I got called. I was going to be a doctor. I was going to be Dr. David. But God had a different idea, and he called me into the ministry. 
And then all of a sudden, stuff happened at church, and it was hard for a while. But then in 1992, the Spirit of God moved on our congregation once again, and there was a call to prayer. And that congregation gathered and began to pray. And matter of fact, uh, this August 23rd, it was August 23rd, 1992, when the Spirit of God called the congregation to pray. And this year will be the 30th year anniversary of that event. And to this day, three to 400 people still come together, call on God, pray on a weekly prayer meeting. And you know, my girls grew up in that. My girls were shaped by, yes, the pulpit, yes, the prayer, but the missionette leaders and the youth pastors and the, and the moms and the dads that were their friends that loved Jesus and were just living out the things of God in their lives. And they were shaped by the people of God that had been revived. And it impacted their lives. And it impacted my family. And it's been a blessing. The church, yeah, I know it's easy to say, yeah, oh, the church. And it is hard sometimes. Being in any family is hard sometimes. But the church is the conduit for the blessing of God for us and for our children. And you know, again, I want to say that it is the reason that we can commend one, from one generation to, not, to the other generation the blessings of God and the, and the work of God. The church is the primary conduit of God's blessing and discipleship for God's people. And that's what Jesus started. Let me go back, though. This whole thing we call the church um, started with Jesus. And Jesus did something very, very special. You know, I'm going to jump actually to a scripture, Colossians 3.16, if I can put that up there. Remember, this is talking to the church. So Colossians, Paul said, church, if I add that, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another with all spiritual wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's what we get to do. We get to have the song of God in our heart. We get to be able to speak to one another with the wisdom that God gives. And Paul here admonishes, that's, that's our job. That's our job. Then he, in Hebrews it says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, church, as some are in the habit of doing. In other words, the writer to Hebrews was saying, Come on, people, gather it's important. It's important to be in each other's presence. Uh, some are having and doing. But what? We encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, Jesus launches the church, taking the people of God a step beyond their history. When Jesus started this thing, if you remember, it was a Jewish culture. There was something called the synagogue. It was a place where if you had 10 men, 13 years old or older, that means you could gather together. And Jesus changed it. And he said, you know what? Where two or three are gathered, doesn't matter if it's male or female, doesn't matter if it's Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter if it's slave or free, I will be in the midst And you know, that's Jesus did something quite revolutionary. Let me take you back, and I want to talk about the birth of the church, because I think it gives you an idea. It gave me an idea of what it means to be here together. Jesus did three things. He announced the church at a place called Caesarea Philippi. He redeemed the church at Calvary, at the cross and death and resurrection, and he empowered the church in Acts chapter uh, 2, which what really is where the church exploded, as we know. And I'm going to kind of take you on a survey of all of those events here. Jesus used the word church. And what's interesting, it was not an Aramaic word nor a Hebrew word. There were four languages that were kind of the languages of Jesus' day. There was uh, Latin and Aramaic. Latin was basically spoken by the Roman soldiers. Aramaic was the street language. 
Um, then there was Greek, which was the language of commerce and was the most widely spoken amongst commerce and widely spoken across the Roman uh, Empire at that time. And then lastly, the religious would have uh, spoken Hebrew. So Jesus, we know, prob- you know, most certainly spoke Aramaic, Greek, and probably Hebrew. And Jesus, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> my wife has this term. She goes, there's a lot of linguistic theft these days. People are changing the meaning of words. Well, Jesus did that. Jesus actually took two Greek words and he sowed them into the church. One of them is the word agape. I don't know if you know, but the word agape was a Greek word that was rarely used. Matter of fact, we can go back in literature and we can go all the way back to Homer And it's only used like two times in ancient literature, the word agape. Jesus takes a word agape, and he makes it the centerpiece of what it means to love. Before that, the word for love in the Greek was primarily eros, which is emotional love, and or phileo, which is friendship love. And that's what people would commonly use. And all of a sudden, Jesus took an ancient word, 800 years, hadn't been very used at all, and he goes, poof. I'm going to talk to you about something different. I'm going to talk to you about sacrificial love, this word called agape. And the second word that he, in a sense, stole out of culture was the word we call church. We translate church, and it's called ecclesia. And if you go, if we can get the slide up there, the word for church that is a Greek word, ecclesia, is a compound two-segment word, ek, which basically means out of, and kaleo, which basically means to call. And Jesus, at a very specific point, made a break from the synagogue, and he said, I am going to build my called out ones, or the ones that I am taking out of darkness into light, and they are going to be my people. Beforehand, every Jew would have considered themselves a child of God, a child of Israel, a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They would have seen themselves as that. Jesus in the most unusual place, said, nope, I'm gonna, you're going to be called something else. And it's not going to be 13 men. It's going to be two or three. It's going to be the called out ones, the ones that have been called out of darkness, the ones that are called out of a religious background and into grace, the ones that are called out from this world and, and the principles of this world into principles and kingdom ways. And Jesus did something very specific at a place called Caesarea Philippi. There are three places, Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus announces the church, Calvary, where he institutes by his, by his death and resurrection, and Pentecost, Passover was when Jesus died. Pentecost is a Jewish holiday. Uh, it's called the Feast of Weeks. And that was another uh, very important, was, it was a celebration of a harvest, which I think is ironic that Jesus used that to pour out his spirit and have a huge harvest time. Those are the three times of where the church is really established. But I want to start with uh, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16 let me give you, um, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, well, I'll, let's just first read it. When they came to a uh, district named Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been killed at that time. Um, this is, by the way, nine months or so before Pentecost, or before Passover and Calvary. They said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, the favor of God is on you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, meaning rock, And on this rock, I will build my church, my called out ones. And the gates of hell, gates were often places of authority and of judgment. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that's where Jesus uses for the very first time 
the word church. Jesus actually used church twice. Once was here. The first time was here. The second time in Matthew chapter 18, he talks about if a brother sins, bring him to the church. And it's very much uh, because church in the Greek sense was a gathering of people that would, would talk together. Um, it very much fits. So anyway, this is two times. So the redemption of the church um, is the second part, and that's where Jesus established the church, and that's the cross. And I just threw up a, uh, a little saying there from Thomas Aquinas. He said, without the cross, there is no church and there is no salvation. That is where Jesus establishes the church. So he announces it, he establishes it, and the third leg, if you want to call it the third leg, is the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, uh, where 3,000 people are brought into the church on, any one, on one day. Matter of fact, um, that day, I love that day, if you read. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through it very quickly with you. There were 120 believers gathered together to pray, probably at first light, or at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, let's say. We don't quite know where they were. We don't know if they were in, a, in an upper room or if they were actually uh, in a place on the Temple Mount where the temple was. But it says that a mighty rushing wind in Acts 2, 2 through 4 came from heaven like a sound of a mighty rushing wind and the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Matter of fact, then it says the young church, again, whether or not they were in, they were in an upper room, we don't know, or they were on the Temple Mount, it says that people from all nations began to hear them praising God in their own tongue. Some people said, oh, man, they're drunk. And other people said, no, I hear them glorifying God. And there was a lot of confusion. Again, remember, it was a feast day. So there were thousands of people who would have gone up to the temple at that and brought their, their first, the first fruits of their harvest for the Feast of Weeks. And there are thousands of people. And all of a sudden, there's this stir of 120 people. Some people are thinking, wow, they're crazy. Other people are going, no, there's something going on there. And then it says that Peter, one of the 12, gets up and he starts to preach. And in verse 22 through 24, he basically reminds them of their godly history. And then he reminds them of their rebellion. And he says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by you all, remember he's talking to a large crowd, with mighty works and wonders and signs uh, that God did through your midst. As you know, this Jesus delivered up a definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Speaking about the Romans, uh, God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And it says then later, it says, then when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. 3,000 of them, all of a sudden, they, they had known what happened on Passover when Jesus was crucified. Here now, 50 days later, is the next Jewish holiday, Feast of Weeks. And some of these same people hearing this stirring and this group of people that all of a sudden are you know, very, very different. And one of them saying, this is God's plan. He redeemed. Now he's saying this. He's saying, when they heard, they said to Peter, what are we going to do? What should we do? And Peter said, repent, be baptized for every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says 3,000. I think we gloss over that number. 3,000 confessed Jesus, repented, and were baptized. Have you ever thought about how that even happened? Think about it. They're on a temple mount. Okay, I've been there. It's big. You know, maybe 10,000 people could be in that temple mount area, maybe 15 even. 3,000 of them get baptized. Well, there was no place up there. More than likely, they went all the way down to the pool of Shalom, which would have meant that they would have left their, their, 
the, the, the festival and gone down. Matter of fact, it's about a quarter mile down to the pool of Shalom. It's where Jesus healed um, uh, uh, in the stirring of the water um, later, it, the stirring of the water. But they walked, walked all the way down there. It's about, uh, it's about 380 feet below the Temple Mount. So it's quite a hike. They go all the way down, and 3,000 of them get baptized. That means that either the disciples baptized 275, which would have taken, I don't know how long it takes to baptize someone, but Sam, have you ever baptized 275? Not yet. Not yet. Maybe someday. My guess is the 120 filled with the Holy Spirit excited about Jesus, all travel down together. Can you see it? 3,000 people going down this road. I mean, it's quite steep all the way down to the Pool of Shalom. The Pool of Shalom is about, about I've been there, it's been about, it's about 50, 40 feet wide and about maybe 100, 120 feet wide or so. And I can see just baptism, 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 baptism. And what do they do? They get baptized, they make it all the way back, and they basically uh, become part of this new called out ones out of their history to now something called the church. And the, it ends up in verse 2, 42, verse 47, and it says this about him. It says, and then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. There's four things there. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. Matter of fact, Pastor Sam highlighted this last uh, week a little bit when he said that Jesus would often say, you've heard it said, speaking of their old ways of Judaism, but now I say. And so for a long time, the apostles was, were reorienting this church and saying, no, there is, you're not living under the law anymore. Now you're living under grace. You know, you used to think this way, but now, guess what? There is, there is a sacrifice that has cleansed you. You don't have to go through the works. It's what Jesus has done. So they're reorienting him, them, by the apostles' teaching. And it's so important for us even to have our minds reoriented from what the world says and what our culture says to what the Word of God says. And then it says they fellowship together. The word there, koinonia, literally means that they just spent time. They created friendships. That's what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to fellowship and have fun together and be in, in relationship with one another. It says they uh, would break bread. There's actually two meanings here. Not only is it communion, but it is also just meals in people's homes and for prayer. And that word prayer literally means, for, in their concept of prayer, it would be everything from singing the Psalms, of David to official prayer. And so it is what we do here when we sing. That is, that is part of that prayer. And the results, awe came upon every soul. The most powerful sign of God moving in a church is when awe is present. When people stand back and go, Wow, that's different. Wow, that's cool. When I was 18 years old, the things that were happening in my church, I would go, wow, that's cool. That's really fun. Because I saw lives. My best friend who was, you know, he was, he was great, but he got involved with a lot of pot and with some drugs when he was 16 years old. We grew up on the same block, and Brad went his way, and he was not doing well. And you know what happened to him? A Sunday school teacher. His brother got saved. His mom was a Catholic. She started coming to church, and all of a sudden, Brad came to a volleyball night hosted by a Sunday school teacher, and I'm like looking, and I'm going, Brad's here. Whoa, what's he doing here? Because I knew, I mean, I knew his life. And I remember the Sunday school teacher shares the gospel and has everyone bow their head. And then at the end, he goes, you, come with me. And he walks Brad into the back room, shares the gospel with him. And my drug friend 
get saved. And you know what? Radical transformation of Brad. Radical fa- transformation. We end up standing down at his, uh, at his house at night, looking up at the stars and saying, God, what are you going to do with us? I ended up being a pastor for 35 years. Brad, you know, he went to China. He went to China for 25 years, and tens of thousands of people came to know Jesus through the ministry of Brad and Crystal Bowen and, and the church network there. He taught, on, he taught in all sorts of churches and leaders. As a matter of fact, even now in places in western China, which I shouldn't talk about, but I will, we have people going because of Brad's influence that happened because of a volleyball night and a person in the church who said, hey, you, come here and shared the gospel with him. It caused me to go, wow, God, you are so cool. You can change my friend's life. That's what church is to be. That's what I want church. I want, I want Arlington to go, wow, that's cool. What's going on over there? I want to be a part of that. And I think that's what God has done. You know, that story of my family in Sweden, of what happened in Philadelphia, what happened in my church, I know it's happened here. I know it's happened in your lives. Matter of fact, every Christian denomination, you can point back to a move of God, to where God swept in. He did something special. And the people went, whoa, wow. And people gathered. But I could stop there. And we could have an altar call and say, let's do it. I want to take you back and go a little bit deeper, if I may. Here's sermon number two. I haven't preached in three years, so (laughs) here is sermon two. There is so much backstory to the birth of the church. There is so much nuance that sometimes if you read, you just kind of go, oh, that's cool, that I want to bring you into. Jesus used very flawed people like you and me, to usher in his kingdom. And I want to break the idea that the church is only for people who are put together, because it's not. The church is about normal people with lots of flaws that God calls together, and God does a miraculous thing in them. They are called out into something new. And that's what I believe God wants to do here. Let me take you back all the way, all the way back to Caesarea Philippi because I think it's super illustrative of what God was doing. Before Caesarea Philippi, the disciples were with Jesus. They were in a place called uh, Bethsaida and, and there was 4,000 people that Jesus was preaching to. And these 4,000 people, and we'll get to that slide here in a moment, um, were all fed. But if you understand, and if you have to read behind the lines, and if you do a little search on history, um, the Romans weren't so excited about that. They didn't like 4,000 Jewish people in this huge crowd. That was just men, so it could have been 10,000 people meeting together and having Jesus, uh, a, a preacher, preach to them. And it created, if you, if you look at history, it would create a stir. And Jesus and his disciples, after that event, they don't go towards Israel or towards Jerusalem. They literally go the opposite direction, and they kind of get out of Dodge. They go to a place called Caesarea Philippi, which is northeast of Israel. And uh, it is actually a town that was rebuilt in the first century by Herod the Tetrarch, which is the son of Herod the Great. And he built it very Roman. And in Caesarea Philippi, I've been there. Uh, you can actually look at it. This is what a, they think it looked like in the first century. The next picture is what it looks like today. That to the left, that dark uh, cave there, is um, literally, they called it uh, the gate of hell, okay? The Greeks would have uh, believed that too, because remember in Greek uh, uh, mythology, Hades was underground, and that would have been the entrance to Hades. This whole area was dedicated to a god called Pan, and 
where it happened in Caesarea Philippi makes Las Vegas look calm, okay? I'll just say that. The things that happened there with the brokenness and the prostitution and all of the, for whatever, you know, the horrible, the worst of humanity was happening right here. And what's interesting to me is Jesus takes uh, these disciples, these young Jewish boys, and remember they're basically from age 16 to 22. Peter's probably around 22, 23 years old. He's married. He leaves his net. But he takes these disciples with him, and rather going towards Jerusalem, towards the Temple Mount, he takes them the opposite direction. And he takes them kind of into the belly of the beast, And there he stands and he says, who do men say that I am? With all of his disciples looking at the wickedness and the brokenness of the world, he says, who do men say that I am? And his disciples say, well, you know, John the Baptist, is that a good answer? Or Jeremiah? And and Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it's interesting what Jesus says. He says, Simon, which means hearer, by the way, very common Jewish name. You, hearer, you are going to be called Peter Rock because on that understanding, on that revelation of what my Father has, has given you, I am going to call, I am going to build my church, my called out ones. On that place, in the midst of hell, where, where the worst of the worst is, that's where I'm calling them out. That's where I'm pulling them from. And Peter makes this big declaration, and it's like, woo, I got the right answer. You know, I'm the the top dog, disciple, all that kind of stuff. And from there, they go up to the Mount of Transfiguration one week later. And then Jesus says something really interesting. After that, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over, and I'm going to die. And Peter goes, oh, heaven forbid. And one of the harshest rebukes of all scripture from, you know, blessed are you, Peter, to get behind me, Satan, happens in two weeks. Let me, let me give you a little bit of history here because I think it's really important to understand. These disciples, Peter specifically, was called when he was a fisherman. Three years previous, Um, his younger brother, Andrew, went down to check out Andrew, or check out John the Baptist. While he's down there checking out who this new prophet was, okay, they come across Jesus. And Andrew comes running back to Peter, who was, they they were down in the Jordan River, and at 15, 14, 15 years old, he comes running back to his family and says, I think I found the Messiah. And Peter, his older brother, said, yeah, right. Now, give you a little bit of background. In Jewish education, um, actually, there was, a pro- uh, there, was a, uh, there was a rabbi called Hillel in about 70, set up an education system in Israel. The first years of your education, ages 5 through 7, was called Bet Torah. And that's where young men would just memorize Scripture. And all young men would just memorize the passages of the Old Testament. And then they would go on to the next level. And then the last level is where uh, a rabbi saw a special uh, favor or special blessing on a man. And they would, they would have a rabbinical call. And they would say, I, wanna, I want you to be my, in later years it was called Talmudin or my disciple. And I want you to learn my rabbi's yoke. I, wanna, I want you to learn my, my teaching. And so for a rabbi to call a young man would have been a huge blessing. And here Peter is, he's fishing, he's doing his family business. Jesus comes, he stands, he preaches, and then he he says to Peter, he says, let's go out a little ways and let's throw a net out. And so Peter does, and boom, there's this huge uh, catch of fish. And what does Peter do? He falls at his knees and says, away, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus looks at him and he says, follow me which was a rabbinical call to say, I want you to be my disciple. I want you to be my Talmudin. I want you to follow me. And what happens? Peter leaves everything. And we think, wow, that's cool. Peter would leave everything. Well, to some extent, it was a little bit selfish on his point because he's a fisherman, but now he's going to be a rabbi. That's like five jumps in the social sphere, you know. Now all of a sudden you are going from just a a trade man, you know, doing the fish to 
to, to being a rabbi? I'm going to be a follower? I'm going to be a disciple of a rabbi? He, boom, he drops his nets, and he follows Jesus. Funny thing, the first thing that Jesus does, if you read in Luke, he comes up and he grabs a leper, and I can, you know, and he holds a leper, and I can imagine the disciples looking at him going, this is one strange rabbi. You know, he's breaking all the rules. The next three years are incredible for Peter. I mean, they see miracles. They see the feeding of 5,000. Peter gets to walk on water. I mean, there's amazing things that happen all the way to this point where Peter goes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then all of a sudden, they head towards Jerusalem. Peter begins to get it wrong. And he thinks, Jesus, you can't die. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to build my church, and I have to have Calvary. I have to redeem the people. And Peter's like, I don't get it. You know, if everybody else denies you, Jesus, I won't deny you. Before the cock crows three times, Peter, you'll deny me. And you see Peter denying Christ at the most important moment. And it says that he goes out and he weeps bitterly. He had gone from fisherman to disciple Talmudin to seeing all these great things to denying the one that he was following. What does the Bible say? Everything fell apart. We have, you know, we have a hindsight bias. We're like, yeah, but Peter, great things are going to happen. We know the end of the story. Peter didn't know the end of the story. He was just broken. He was crushed. The rock crumbles. What's happened? Jesus, all of a sudden, there's this spring of hope. Jesus is alive. Three days later, hope starts to spring. Jesus appears to them. And I think what happens is Jesus sends Peter and the six others that grew up in Galilee and says, go tell them. I think that's why they go. And they make these 30-day frantic journey. They're hopeful, but they go running all the way back to, to Galilee to where that 4,000 were. And they say, Jesus died, but he rose. I'm not sure the reception. We don't know what the reception is, but we do know this in John chapter 20, 21. It says that Peter makes a decision with the six others and says, I'm going fishing, which is a very powerful statement. He says, I'm going fishing, and they go fishing again. I personally think Peter was throwing in the towel at that moment. He had been through all of this cool stuff. He was crushed. He goes back to Galilee. He shares. We don't know what's happening and what happens. The exact same story of when Jesus called him is now Jesus reestablishes Peter. And if you would put up the verse up there, it says when they, what happens is, you know, Jesus calls to the disciples, say, hey, throw the net on the other side of the boat. And they catch this huge uh, catch of fish. And John goes, I think it's Jesus. Peter throws his, his coat off, he, and he swims to shore, and Jesus has a meal there all set. And then Jesus, after breakfast, says this, Jesus, Simon, hearer, rock, hearer, son of John, do you love me more than these? Jesus uses the word agape there. He says, will you sacrificially give your life for me? Do you love me more than all of this stuff, this, your history, fishing, the, all of this stuff that you're at in Galilee? And he, Peter says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I, you know what he uses there? He doesn't use agape. He says, I, I phileo you. You're my friend. Peter, Jesus looks at him and he says, feed my lambs. Then he said a second time to Simon, hearer of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord. Again, Jesus says, do you love me? Do you agape me? Will you sacrificially give your life? And Peter says to him, Lord, you know, I phileo you. You're my friend. The third time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you Phileo me? Are you my friend? Peter says, and was grieved because Jesus went from agape to phileo. And he said a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, 
you know everything. You know that you're my friend. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. After saying this, Jesus says to this crumbling rock, follow me. This man who had denied Jesus three times, maybe if you want to count this, six times, because he couldn't measure up. He couldn't do it. He couldn't say, I agape you, Jesus. I'm going to give it all, Jesus. And you know what happens? Jesus leaves him and he says, go back to Jerusalem. And they have, remember, Jerusalem is not like get in the car and go down the road. It's three days of hard walking. It's 80 miles. It's like from here to Olympia. You got to walk and you got to walk. The disciples walk, walk, walk all the way to Jerusalem thinking about this. They get back to Jerusalem and we know on day 40 after the resurrection, Jesus ascends to heaven. And then Peter begins to pray with 120. And boom, there's an outpouring of the Spirit. And all of a sudden, we see Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, preaching, and 3,000 people come into, come into the Lord. The Lord restored this broken man and put him right in the center of the church once again. Why do I go through all of that history? Is because Jesus is building his church with imperfect people. Jesus is building his church with people that even would, might have denied him. Jesus is building his church with people that might not even quite get it, but they're willing to say, I want to be a part of this. I think Jesus saying to Arlington Assembly, you called out once, do you agape me? Do you love me? Will you sacrificially go there? Will you be the conduit of blessing for the person sitting in the pew next to you? Will you be the conduit of blessing to all these young people and to those children and to those children workers working with our kids? You may have been Peter, thrown in the towel, said, I'm going to go fishing. You know, Jesus thing, that was cool but I'm going fishing. I think for some of you, God's calling you back. He's calling your name. He's saying, hey, I want you to be my called out ones. I want you to be in the center of my will. I want to do some amazing things. I want you to be able to stand up and say, Jesus, who this world crucifies, he is the source of our salvation. He's doing a new thing. In the church, he's doing a new thing in me. Just like Brad, my friend, is doing the drugs. God called him. Gave his life. He didn't know he was going to go to China for 25 years. He didn't know that the Communist Party was going to grab him one morning at 6 a.m. and throw him in a dark room for 14 hours and interrogate. And then say, later, you're out of here in three days. He had uprooted his family in three days, and he and his family got kicked out of China. He has a heart for the people of China, wants to go back, but he can't. It wasn't smooth sailing. Never is. But will you step in? Will you receive the call of God? The church, what did they do? Lastly, I'll close in this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to God's word. Arlington Assembly, let's let the word of Christ dwell in us richly so that we can teach and admonish one another with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Get the word of God in your heart. What did they do? They fellowship, they koinonia together, they, they, they had friends together and they participated in the, in the family. Guys, don't come once in a while. Be a part of this family. Make this your family. Three, what did they do? They broke bread. They had communion together. They remembered what Jesus had done. And they broke bread in each other's, in, in their homes, if you read the story. Have, each, have others in, the home, in your home with you. Break bread. Talk about the things of God. And then we got to be a people of prayer. we got to spend times in prayer and in worship as a community. And you know what? That's what church is. That's being church 
in relationship with one another, in relationship, calling on God in prayer, in worship, listening to the Word of God and getting it into our heart, that's what it means to be the church. Let's continue to do that. In closing, will you give yourself fully to the Word of God as your source of strength? Will you give yourself to Jesus? Will you allow the Word of God to be in your heart, will you be the called out one? With your eyes closed and your heads bowed, I want to just pray. There may be some in here that are like Peter. You've thrown in the towel. You're not quite sure about this church thing. I still think Jesus is coming after you saying, follow me. Follow me. Not guaranteeing great days, but I am guaranteeing that if you get into the family of God, it will be a blessing to you. It will be the place where God can pour his his blessing because if you're in relationship with one another, God will do some amazing things. If you're here this morning and you know, like Peter, you've just kind of thrown in the towel. You're sitting on the sidelines. You're not quite there. Would you do something for me? Would you acknowledge that just by very quickly an uplifted hand? And I want to pray for you. Okay, there's hands, a lot of hands. Just a second more in the balcony. I see hands. I want to pray for you. Father, for those that have, for whatever reason, been hurt by the church, been hurt by what they thought is supposed to happen. Lord, I pray that you would call them again into the center of your people. Lord, I pray that the hurt would fall off. And Lord, once again, they would say yes to you. Yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you that raised your hands, would you tell somebody Would you just tell maybe the person you came with, I've been like Peter, I've been hurt, I've kind of thrown in the towel, I want to be back in the center of God's blessing. And see where that conversation goes. I'm convinced that if you but confess that you want to be in the center of what God is doing, that is the first step of the Lord calling your name and bringing you back. So would you tell somebody Secondly, Arlington Assembly, would you dedicate yourself to the Word of God? Would you dedicate yourself to fellowship? Would you dedicate yourself to the breaking of bread, not only here, but in each other's homes? Would you dedicate yourself to prayer and worship? Because I think in that place, God is going to do amazing things with us. In you and in the children of Arlington Assembly, And I think the result is going to be Arlington standing in awe going, wow, that's cool. I want to be a part of that. I think that's what the Lord wants to do here. Dedicate yourself. Acts 2.42. Go home, read it, think about it, let it sink into your heart. Amen? Pastor Sam, if you'd come.